struck by the diversity of our experiences, the words we use for each other, the ideas, but yet at the same time, not that different. Um, and of course, both of those are true and not, what can you say? But um, uh, I want to open up another question and you know, we can start having conversations back and forth, whoever anyone wants. Um, it kind of relates to what everyone has spoken about. I'm just curious about, specifically with writing, um, you know, I think that writing creates visibility in a way that often doesn't happen as a gay or lesbian or bi or queer or transgender or genderqueer or whatever you use for yourself as a name or don't use, a person walking down the street or going to a supermarket or, you know, walking somewhere with a partner or, or even people who are not queer. Um, I think we are not read, quote, quote, uh, for who we feel to be. Uh, and that can include ethnicity and anything, religion, uh, you know, what kind of soup you like, you know, anything, which is less important, of course, but I'm just curious about the ways for each of you that writing has changed that, or hasn't, or has it um, allowed you to feel more who you feel to be inside, or be, um, etc. Um, to give some reality to um, 
the things we lived and experienced and ways ways of knowing. Um, for my, in my case, it's it's creating a tribal. I call it a tribal history. It's my family's history, but my family's embedded in that in our tribe, Concow, and and um, so it becomes necessary to because I don't have that history somewhere else. It's not something I can turn to. I can't open a history book and read about my people, um, my nation. So it, it becomes necessary to, to create that as a reality and as something that I remember hearing from my mother and she had stories from her family, from her parents and her um, grandmother. So um, it's a way to carry things on, to, to have poetry, to have poetry as a vehicle for doing that. That's, that's um, I guess, at least part of the way. Growing up of a family, um, uh, I, I see myself um, having starting. I think I started to write primarily because of my engagement with language and how I used it around my parents. Um, my, uh, I mean, growing up, um, my parents were a little. I mean, they, they were they were lovely and they you know took care of me and respected me, um, but I mean, they were also very volatile, and so there were moments, um, I, I was, I would calculate in my head, um, like after, like, my, my mother had an argument or blew up, um, I, I would, I would be the one who always comforted, or comforted her, and so I had to calculate in my head, like, how much time it would take um, before I could walk in without getting my head chewed off. Um, so it was sort of this um, very intentional pacing of when can I go in, when can I come out, um, uh, what, how loud do I talk to my mother, how low do I talk to my mother. Um, so it was always this constant questioning of how, how do I use my voice and um, my pacing to um, influence my my mother um, to to gain approval and make her feel um, uh, stronger in a sense, I guess. Um, so that's I think that's where I started thinking about um, language very consciously. I have no idea if I'm going to answer your question because now I'm like responding to kind of <laughs> things, much more interesting. Things, I have like no idea what's going question. on. Um, I, I had so many thoughts. Um, well, one thing that came up for me when we were talking about um, responding to your family and things like that, I grew up in the South, um, pretty poor, um, you know, young, poor white girl is the way I, you know, grew up in. That to me, um, using language in from that specific context, projecting my voice, taking up space, being aggressive, was totally radical, you know. And it was like claiming space and and doing um, some some really political stuff, you know. And that's how it felt was really empowering and transitioning. You know, now people see you know a white guy, if not a straight white guy, which honestly terrifies me. Um, and I, it's no, it's no uh, disrespect to anyone's identity, it just terrifies me to be seen that way, even though this is what I've chosen. Um, so figure that out. Uh, <laughs> 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 Talk to my therapist. Um, but uh, it's, it's also been another project then of figuring out, well, what does it mean to use my voice now, and how do I use it, and and to what end, so what used to be empowering and radical is now status quo, and so I now have to figure out how to use my voice uh, in ways um, that are, are differently empowered, right? so that they're not oppressive. Um, so, so that was one thing that, that came up. Um, and then also just thinking about my childhood, I also grew up uh, Pentecostal, so like you know, speaking in tongues and kind of doing that whole thing, which is fascinating. Um, but um, but one thing that I, when I think about language around that, separate from the speaking in tongues part, is 
What I was really taught is the way that one is saved is through language. It's actually not through deed. So it's not through your body. It's not through your actions. All you got to do is say this. Just say it and you're good to go. You can do whatever you want. You know? <laughs> and it was like, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> I feel pretty uncomfortable with that. Um, so it just felt very slippery, which I referenced earlier. But I was just thinking about that, that religious and sort of cultural context of that language can suddenly be this powerful thing that that would truly, you know, save me for eternity and it didn't matter what I did, and, uh, which was very confusing. So. All right, I'm going to read three things. One is a quote by T.C. He gave it an interview. One is a quote by Virginia Woolf, and one is just a word. I want you to respond to any of them. And then we'll open up for questions, because we're nearing the end of our time. Not yet, but soon. Okay. So um, the quote, actually, by Virginia Woolf is from her book, A Second Common Reader, in an essay called, which is mildly ironic on her part, How Should One Read a Book? Question mark. Quote, the other side of the mind is now exposed, the dark side that comes uppermost in solitude, not the light side that shows in company. And she's speaking of reading and writing. The quote by TC says, Quote, we've heard so much about this idea of tolerance, and I think, honestly, that idea is so tepid and just really offensive. Tolerance says you're other, you're different, and we'll let you exist over there. When I don't think that's the goal, I think the goal is moving beyond tolerance and into celebration and, and in connection with people. And the word is desire, so I need those. <laughs> uh, well, the, the project I'm working on now, um, I also grew up in the South, um, so I, I know about how that goes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I told myself that I would never write about the South, and um, I wanted to, but I decided I wanted to find a way to actually write about it and address it. And um, so I've sort of adopted these. Um, sort of gay male personas that um, are, I, this is going to sound really bad probably, but um, are sort of taking all of the violence um, that surrounded me in, in that period of my life and sort of turning it back onto the perpetrators of that violence. So um, creating this sort of um, both feminine, feminine and masculine um, speaker who um, who is embracing, you know, hunting and having that rifle and um, you know harassing people and um, uh, I guess the serial killer fits into that, to that description. Um, uh, it's very fantastical and kind of silly, but at the same time, um, I don't know, like he like drills a wine key into somebody's eye and like pops it out like a cork. Um, so I mean, uh, it's kind of like fantastical and bizarre, but um, I want to sort of address that sort of nature of like constant, constantly being surrounded by violence. Um, so, and that, I think that goes with that whole tolerance issue, like tolerate, not tolerate, can't everyone just exist like Acceptance. Yeah. Not 